Welcome, cosmic listeners, to a journey unlike any other you've embarked upon. As the vastness of space stretches out before us, so too does the vastness of our own minds. This is where the ethereal meets the extraterrestrial, where inner space meets outer space. I'm your guide, alongside my hosts, Doro and Matt, and you're tuning into the intersection of meditation and mysteries beyond our stars. Picture this, a vast universe, ever-expanding, filled with stars, galaxies, and possibilities. Now visualize our own minds equally deep, intricate, and filled with untapped potential. What if these two worlds aren't as separate as they seem? All right, here we are again. Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Matt and Doro. I am Matt Reddy. I'm an author, artist, activist, creator of Hive1.net, a social media platform for global revolution and transformation for utopia. And I'm also a locally elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. And I am once again joined by my good friend, Doro Kiley, life coach extraordinaire and longtime meditator and meditation teacher. Her website is creationcoach.com. Hi, Doro. Thanks for joining me again today. Hi, Matt. What a wonderful introduction. And boy, your bio is is uh, impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so I... I've been looking forward to this one. You uh, you went to the uh, conference last week, and boy, I'm uh, we didn't do this last week because you were busy. I'm really looking forward to this one. So thanks for yeah. having me again. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. We took a week off because I was attending the Stairway to the Stars uh, uh, conference. It's Disclosure Fest 2023. I guess they, they've done a Disclosure Fest event each year for a while, and this one was titled Stairway to the Stars. And yes, I definitely have some, uh, some uh, thoughts and experiences to share from that. Um, and there's also some uh, just dis- alien disclosure news updates we can uh, we can get into. Absolutely, I'm I'm ready. <laughs> All right, and we are we are live uh, broadcasting on in a Twitter space. So if anyone jumps in there, you will be getting the completely unedited live version of this podcast, and then we will release it as usual on uh, on Spotify and in the podcast universe and on youtube so let's see shall we just uh i have a lot of notes here that i put together before today's show um that's let's awesome see. let's let's i mean i'm curious do they, are they in order like from from <laughs> speakers or subjects just curious well, well i did a couple different things one I, I just started to try to put um, my understanding of the different theories and uh, that sort of I try to put ufology into a, a spectrum because that's definitely something I got from the conference is there's there's different sort of schools of thought of people that think what's going on. And so there, so I, I have those sort of grouped. Um, and then so, so I, I'm looking at a lot of notes and material here because uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to introduce people to this topic and uh, sort of also breaking up the info between what is what are sort of the opinions of, you know, very established mainstream people like U.S. senators, congressmen, scientists, and then you have, you know, people on this other end of the spectrum that are experiencers, they believe they've contacted aliens or communicated with aliens, or they've researched it and listened to all of the most, uh, you know, the most extreme whistleblowers that claim to have seen stuff and so um yeah so i've got a lot of uh a lot of notes here so i'm let me just sort of see i got a couple let me try to share things in order from the easiest to digest to and before we get into the, the crazy stuff right <laughs> perfect that sounds good let's okay. go so let's see uh let's we'll start with a little um news update uh so David Grush, the uh, the former intelligence officer, whistleblower, he he filed a inspector general complaint 
which is sort of, you know, which really kicked off this alien disclosure movement in Congress in a big way. And uh, his complaint apparently details everything he knows about the about the U.S. government's secret UFO retrieval and reverse engineering program, as well as uh, it seems to indicate a lot of history of what has been happening behind the scenes since at least 1945, Roswell and possible murders or assassinations, crimes done with the military industrial complex. All of this information is apparently in a document that he submitted officially to the to one of the inspector generals and Congress, Congress people like Tim Burchett and others have been trying to get access to this document to really read it, to find out what's going on. Uh, they were supposed to get, or they were scheduled to have, to go into a secure facility yesterday and they were told they were gonna get to see more of this complaint. They weren't sure if they were gonna get to read the whole thing or if they were just gonna be given some really glossed over summary um, but that got canceled. So the, the powers behind the scenes blocked that from happening. Darn. Yeah. Wow. But there's, but there's a mixed bag with that because uh, Congressman Burchett went on to a podcast and he said the problem is if they get told a bunch of classified stuff in this skiff, they really are legally obligated to not tell us. And so it kind of would paralyze them if they are told a huge secret, something like, I mean, if they go in there and they're told JFK was killed by the CIA to hide the aliens, they would not be allowed to come out and tell us. And so it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, Tim Burchett said he, he wants to do public hearings and he wants to get whistleblowers to come out in public. So it's said in public so that we can all face this information and sort of wrestle with it together. Um, so there's so there's a little. Uh, so that happened. That's one sort of uh, note. The. Another thing that happened is uh, the the office that the Pentagon created called Arrow, which is uh, the all domain, um, anyway, it's a UAP office and controlled by the Pentagon, which a lot of people believe is just, you know, Blue Book 2.0. It's just the Pentagon's effort to continue to conceal this. That's been headed by this guy named Kirkpatrick, who every time you see him interviewed, he, he clearly seems sort of like a slippery snake trying to dismiss all this. But he's been asked or moved to resign. And so everyone's kind of curious if they're going to put someone in the head of that office that actually has some uh, more willingness to uh, reveal something and to tell us what's going on. But it's just sort of kind of drama behind the scenes there. Boy. So, um well, yeah. I'm, I'm, I am curious, did you uh, pick up any information about what was going on with uh, trying to cut off funding for these uh, operations, these covert operations? Um, are they still working on trying to get that passed? Yes. Well, yeah. so that brings us sort of to the, the, the big, big thing that is just hanging out there is called the, uh, the UAP legislation, the Schumer Amendment. Um, that Senator Schumer put forward a, a couple months ago, and it is it is a powerful piece of legislation. It has not passed yet. It's it is, it, but it's stuck into the National Defense Authorization Act, and it should pass in December um, since it it takes billions of dollars into the military and everything. And they always pass this thing eventually. But once this thing passes, um, it could be the uh the thing that breaks things wide open yeah the and what this thing will do is it will do all sorts of things uh i believe like giving um yeah make it making it possible for them to cut off funding to any programs that are uh doing anything with alien technology that they have not officially reported to congress it actually gives the u.s government the right to seize any and all alien technology if anyone um, in private industry is holding it. Um, it creates a uh, this uh, a UF a UAP records review board that is an independent agency supposedly that will have the authority to declassify information about UFOs and UAP records, um, and it it'll be fully under the control of the executive branch, the president. Um, 
it, it does a lot of powerful things. It's it, it would be so it, it you know it's still like you know there's some people that believe it'll it won't do enough. It'll still sort of like compartmentalize the information. But but this is one thing I um at this uh, conference I went to. Uh, you know, Lou Elizondo's lawyer was there. His name is Daniel Sheehan, and he is an incredibly famous activist lawyer. He was involved with the Pentagon Papers, which helped expose the the cause, uh, what was behind the Vietnam Vietnam War. Um, I believe the Iran Contra scandal. He was involved with uh, lawsuits related to that, and so. Uh, I was really surprised he was there because it's a pretty woo-woo conference with a lot of sort of psychics and channelers and yeah. people that believe they communicate with aliens. But what was his name again? Let me write that down. Just uh, look him up a little bit. Daniel Sheehan. Sheehan. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And he's and he's Lou Elizondo's lawyer, and Lou Elizondo is the first big whistleblower to come out of the Pentagon uh, mm -hmm. several years ago. Um, and he was interviewed in that sixty minutes uh, piece that was done about. Uh, UFOs and UAPs and the Tic Tac incident. So it was it was really I didn't actually talk to him. Um, I I tried to a couple times. I went to his big talk and in his talk he went over the Schumer amendment in detail and just oh, really went down piece by piece of how this thing really should through legislation uh, try to seize control of this this story of this information and 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 find a way to extract it and, and and reveal details to the public without endangering our military secrets and things like that. Oh my goodness. This is, this is going to be interesting. I'm going to follow this one closely. Yeah. And I've got, I got a quote from Christopher Mellon here, who is a former uh, deputy secretary of defense. Um, I thought I had that right in front of me here. He said he he believes that this amendment really will um, put us in the end zone in terms of getting uh, this information out there. Yeah. But um, all right. So that's that's some of the uh, details. Uh, let's see here. So. So that's the government political update. Yes. Yes. So now well, let's, are you going to talk about that conference? <laughs> it's going to be interesting. Okay. So yeah. the conference, um, let's see. I mean, there were, um, I went to several events that were by experiencers, like by people that claim they communicate with aliens, like one Bashar, you've heard of Bashar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, Bashar is very, and his thing was incredibly popular. Um, he is, I was going to find his like little description here. He, he basically claims to be channeling this, his name's not actually Bashar. The, Bashar is the name of the alien that he claims to channel. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but um, in what he talks about is more sort of like, He's sort of in the narrative that humanity is, uh, and part of ufology, part of the ufology group. Some people believe, you know, humanity is trying to evolve, um, and aliens are trying to help humanity become more enlightened and less warlike, and achieve peace and join the galactic community. There's a there's a group of uh, in the ufology world that believe that's the relationship that humans have with aliens. There is um, one of the interesting sort of distinctions I found is that there are um, there are are some people like there's this group called the Asterius the so Society, uh, which has been around a long time, and they had a presentation there, and it was it was like founded like back in the 50s by a guy a guy named uh, Doctor his name is Doctor King I think it's uh, but it's not. Is that serious like the star system serious? It is. is okay. Uh, S S I R uh serious society. Um yeah, it's like AE, you know, Asterius. Um, oh, okay. oh yeah. Aetherius Society by George King in the mid 1950s. That's A E T H E R I U S. Oh, oh okay. E and it's it's categorized as a religious movement. But this guy, George King, 
who was practicing uh, like meditation and yoga for like eight hours a day. He eventually said he started to communicate with cosmic masters um, that were, you know, they said they were to help humanity solve its earthly problems and advance into the new age. Very, very interesting presentation there from this group. And they had an, an interview with George King back from, it was like 1950s in London. It was a full on UFOs are real and the government's hiding it uh, protest that he helped lead back then. So this has been going on a long time. Wow. That's and, amazing. Uh, yeah. But, and, and I like, uh, but the interesting thing about him and uh, his, the, that group, I went up to them after their presentation, asked if he believed the gray aliens were real, that people were really being abducted, that possibly they had made a you know treaty with Eisenhower in 1950. And he didn't, they don't believe that. He doesn't believe there are any evil aliens. He doesn't even believe these abduction stories are true. He, he believes they're misinterpretations or maybe they're done by the government. It's kind of similar to what Stephen Greer seems to say, that there aren't really evil aliens. There's malevolent people in the government that might do some abductions to confuse people and to make people believe there's some evil aliens, maybe to uh, you know go along with that Project Bluebeam yeah. fake alien invasion theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm waiting to see if that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I tend to agree with that. I mean, just my own intuitive sense that I get, you know, through through meditation and all through my life, I've been in contact with uh, some somebody who I've called Charlie my whole life. I've got a blog on my website. Um, and I would agree that there aren't any uh, alien, evil, demonish people. Um, I do think it's mostly humans that are doing that, but that's my opinion. So do you, what do you think of the alien abduction stories? What do you think is happening with those? I, I believe in those. In fact, you know, since we've been talking and working on this, I have been actually uh, feeling that there was a time in my childhood, which I thought was a, a dream. And I, now I'm thinking maybe it did happen um, where I was about eight years old and I experienced, I was outside and I looked over a kind of a embankment and I saw uh, a spaceship with, with aliens walking around. And, and then I just sort of went blank and I, and I was wondering, you know, maybe they picked me up and put me in their ship. I don't know. Um, but I was, that was my dream. And so I was wondering if that was actually something that happened. Cause I do hear that they do these mind wipes, these memory wipes, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe <laughs> it's just making me think anything is possible at this point. Yeah. So I do, I do believe in abductions. Yeah. Yeah. The, the memory wipe thing is a very common uh, part of these encounter stories. Uh, what did those aliens look like? What did they, what was their appearance? Well, the, the one I saw most clearly was actually, um, th they almost looked like a triangle head. That, I remember that very clearly. And um, big, big eyes, huge eyes. Then, And they looked like a praying mantis to me. But, you know, the memory can play tricks on you. So I, I can't say for sure what they looked like. All I remember was a very triangular head with large eyes um, and tall. Oh. Remember what color they were? It was too dark to, okay. to really tell. Yeah. And okay. when you say praying mantis, did they seem to have an insect like body or are you just saying the head shape sort of reminded you of praying mantis? Um, the head shape definitely reminded me of praying mantis, but also the way they stood because they had their their arms folded at the wrist and and that made me think more of uh praying mantis mm -hmm. but again you know we're, we're talking a lot of years ago and a lot of you know trying to remember in between it could you know it, it may not have been exactly like that but this certainly the triangular head and the big eyes were uh, were really clear and do you remember if they had clothes Oh, he did, thing. yeah. From what I recall, so that that uh, that's a little bit more fuzzy. You know, maybe it was clothes, maybe it was some kind of a weird skin covering. But yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is really because all these years I've always kind of dismissed these powerful dreams as just dreams, and 
listening to all these encounters, um, I'm thinking maybe it did happen. Yeah. And uh, is and Charlie that you communicate is Charlie? Do you do you think of Charlie as now? Charlie is an interesting story because that goes all the way back to even when I was an infant in the cradle. I mean, there was always this sense of a presence around me, and you know, if I was screaming and crying, I could always remember there was this sense of someone there, even though there wasn't. You know, um, just kind of cradling me, uh, not picking me up, but just holding me in that energy. And as I got old, this was pre-verbal, obviously. And then as I got older, um, you know, it, it's almost as if Charlie became a playmate for me. So one of these <laughs> in invisible friends, you know, you always hear about, but, but Charlie was not uh, exterior to me. He was always on the inside. He, he was my imagination. He was my friend and he would teach me things. And one of the greatest things, now think about this. I was eight years old laying in bed thinking about, you know, how far up the sky goes, you know, the kind of thing kids think about. How far is, does the space go? And so I asked, I used to ask Charlie these questions all the time. And this one was really clear. I said, Charlie, how far does space go? And he said, it goes as far as the farthest imagination can take it. And that really blew me away at eight years old. And so, and since then I'm thinking, well, does that mean if there's imaginations on other planets that it keeps continuing out and out? And yeah, it just keeps going. As long as there is an imagination somewhere that can experience that that vision of space going farther and farther, then that's, that's how far space goes. <laughs> Anyway, that, that really hit me when I was little. So yeah, Charlie's always been with me. Charlie, I've got a big uh, blog on my web, my website called My God Charlie. And I've got a lot of the writings. I used to do a lot of uh, automatic handwriting and get all of these lessons from Charlie. Hmm. It was a little bit like Neil Donald's Walsh uh, conversations with God a little bit, kind of like that. Yeah, oh. you would have fit right in into this conference as a oh, speaker. Um, nice. Yeah, and I, I definitely think you qualify as an experiencer <laughs> with that story. <laughs> uh, you told me another one uh, that sticks with me of you seeing uh, one of these mantis beings at your doorway. And you oh, were... yeah. Yeah, that one I was uh, I was in bed. Um and I was waking up and I looked and there was a light in the hallway. My room was dark, a light in the hallway. And there was the perfect silhouette of, again, this same kind of uh, large, tall, triangular head uh, shape. It was mostly the silhouette, um, but it was kind of shocking. And the body was, it was very thin. Um, and it scared the daylights out of me. I just, I just ducked under the covers, <laughs> hid my little head, uh, and and I uh, tried to tried to pretend it wasn't there. Yep. <laughs> scary. Yep. Yeah. So, and you know, for those of listeners who might be new to this topic, if if you do a survey of all alien encounter stories, the uh, the mantis aliens are one of the ones that they're one of the least ones that are reported like uh, like down at two percent. You know, it's mostly gray aliens. Then there's some uh, and that's like vast majority are with some sort of gray alien with large black eyes, um, some tall, some little uh, shorter, often together. Seems like the tall ones are directing the small ones. Um, and then there's reptilian aliens that are seen and then mantis aliens. And then there's sort of human looking Nordic like aliens, um, uh, sometimes Nordic, not necessarily blonde Nordic. And that's something I asked the Aetherius Society. I was like, OK, so you believe there's only enlightened aliens. What do they look like? And they say they, they look human. Um, so that's the ones that they encounter. I would have been fascinated if they had said they're all reptilian or they're all mantis. Right. Um, <laughs> But they're Just was... trying to categorize them as a challenge. Uh, there's so many now. Yeah. And and I went to one panel uh, that had that said they at least one of the people on the panel said they communicated with what's called the Mantis Collective. 
So I was very excited to see, okay, what do you say this, man? Because of you, I was very curious what they would yeah, say. Yeah, now you got me. <laughs> Hope um, you went to it. What did yeah. they say? Yeah. So this panel was really interesting because it had three people on it who every week they get together and channel aliens and talk. And they, uh, I'll put their names in the description because I don't look them up now, but one of them, uh, two of them were men and uh, one communicated with this. And when they communicate with them, they, they, they sit there, they meditate for a few minutes and you can, they're breathing in a strain and they, and they make these, they're really like getting themselves into, I don't know, a trance and like, you know, and then, yeah. <laughs> and then they just embody the alien, like takes control of their body and they communicate like it. And this, uh, one of the guys was, he's very like almost like Robin Williams comedic and intense and making jokes and pop culture references. And um, so that was one of them. Uh, and the, the, the middle one, he was sort of dressed sort of like in a spiritual guru way. And I believe he's, um, I think he clearly says in his description that he channels an alien from the Mantis collective. And, and then there was the woman who she was when she, she was able to channel different aliens she would channel a uh these adult sort of teacher aliens who i think were she said were mantis aliens and and these it, this alien was on a mothership and it was on this ship they had i think thousands of human alien hybrid children that they were raising and educating and then she and i believe one some of the children were hers like she had you know she had uh they had a lot of alien abduction stories seem to indicate that there is an alien human hybridization program going on and they're creating human alien uh babies children and um and and she is saying her children are being raised on this ship and she gets to communicate with them and sometimes they channel through her and so during this during this session each of them would in turn speak as their alien and, and they answered questions they went around and let the room just ask questions and they were answering questions and um so yeah they basically the, the basic gist of what they communicated was that these are good aliens that the purpose of this human alien hybridization program is to create these more enlightened generation of of uh, beings that uh i guess that i don't know if it's building up to some some the, these uh humans these human alien hybrids integrating with humanity helping humanity in some way um i i have a pretty good picture of what what i mean intuitively my my sense is is that they are trying to hybridize all of us everybody um, in order to see if we're capable of creating a more heavenly environment on earth, not, not all this warmongering. That's, yeah. I picked that up real clearly. Yeah, that's, that seems to be the gist of what they were saying. And now I remember they said that the mantis aliens were brought in to help raise the children because the, I, I guess the other aliens that were raising them weren't, it wasn't going as well. So they needed a more enlightened uh, I think, teacher species to help. And that's why the mantis aliens were brought in. I, mm -hmm. I do believe them basically communicating that sort of, uh, it, and that was the impression I got that the mantis aliens were very um, spiritual and in, in enlightened species, which makes sense that they would be the ones connected with you mm -hmm. uh, and your life. Interesting. Um, yeah. And I did, I tried to, I did ask one question during that. I, I was like, gosh, these guys say they're communicating with aliens on motherships. I have so many things I could. I mean, I wish I could have asked more. But the thing I asked them was, do you have AI on your ships? And what is your relationship with it? Because there's, you know, a lot of wonder about if, I mean, if aliens are a thousand, more than a thousand years ahead of us, they have to have developed AI and did it take over? And, or is it, is it its own consciousness on their ship or? What is their relationship? That's a great subject. I mean, even even now, you know, with Elon Musk and all that, trying to integrate the technology into the biology, 
And so, yeah, if we're just starting that now, you know, imagine, you know, 10, 100,000 years in the future, we've probably got that figured out pretty well. Yeah. And so all of us might just be, you know, projections of, of their program, of this program. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So I, so I asked them that, but only the uh, sort of comedian one responded. And what he said was that, you know, the AI on his ship um, basically was like in communion with him. So it was almost like the ship is an extension of him. And so he was like, so if I leave my ship and you tried to steal the ship, it just wouldn't work because it like you'd be trying to like steal something that was connected with, with me and it knows me, something like that. So they didn't they didn't really go into any more detail. You know, I, I would have loved a follow up question like when they were channeling the children, I'd like to ask them. So that I'd like to ask, OK, so children on this mothership, do you get to talk to the AI? Can you ask it questions? Does it teach you? And but but they didn't really give me an answer. Yeah. Um, and then there was an AI panel there, <clears throat> which was a, an uncomfortable panel because it had a it had one guy that was in. I think his name is Adam Curry. He's a he's a high tech entrepreneur, mainstream, you know, de in, involved with developing, you know, real world AI now. And then you had this guy named Adam Apollo, who basically believes, like many of the people at this conference, believe uh, he believes he's a star seed. He is a an alien that has been embodied in many uh, in in many lives lifetimes in many different um lives in this galaxy he believes he's here on a mission uh a protector of humanity and helping humanity and 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 so he was i mean and i liked him he's very like inspired and he's developing he's he's a he's developing software to help people um reclaim their digital identity online and really sort of sim he's sort of like a kindred spirit for me in that sense he's trying to use technology and develop online stuff to really help humanity create a um, an enlightened future beautiful what was um, his name again his name is adam apollo at okay. least that's what he's listed as nice. um yeah and then there was but there was another guy on that actually i think one of the guys uh what's his name henry um he's one of the guys that's on ancient aliens uh oh Lord. right henry oh gosh now i forgot his Henry's name his last name it's like is it philip henry or something or uh um uh, John Henry, might be, I, I'd have to look him up now. <laughs> William, William Henry. William Henry, yes. that's it, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. he, he's a mythologist, historian, TV. So he was on the panel. Um, and then also, but, and then there was this other guy, I don't remember his name, but this, the other guy, he had, he believes we are living in a simulation and that there is a malevolent AI that has gone rogue and is really threatening us and perhaps controlling the simulation and he and uh you know so he really believed that very strongly and it was clear the people on the panel disagreed with what was being said and it was very uncomfortable and it, it wasn't very well facilitated they were kind of you know um people were talking too long and uh it was uh it was and they were they were kind of and you know it was, it was awkward when you go to one of these panels and there's someone talking and there's someone else on the panel that is clearly visually making facial expressions or whatever and shaking their head like no and oh, so yeah kind of <laughs> awkward <laughs> um yeah and then there was another guy on the panel uh that like wasn't talking at all and uh and he and, and he was a uh, he was a black man and i, I just felt like awkward that these you know, some of these guys were just taking so much time and they weren't giving everyone an equal sort of chance to say something. So anyways, but that's, that's just sort well, of you, there. you have a solution for that, right? And we're going to try to get that out to the public for use the vortex concept. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Well, it's, it's extremely, well, I mean, I think it's one of the fundamental challenges we have as a species is learning how to share space, equally, yes. how to, how to, you know, do better than you know, we've come up with what we have in our government, which is, you know, majority rule and Robert's rules of order, which is, it is semi, you know, it's an incredibly flawed system. And when you just have a group of people on a panel and you don't have equal time, you just have basically Lord of the Flies. You just like yeah. talks, who has the most privilege to talk the most and, or just 
hogs the time and and yeah that know, needs to be solved <laughs> yeah yeah and so um as you said i've been working on this as a facilitator for years and i'm i am trying to finish up one version of the software i've built that all it does is give people equal time to speak it just shares the microphone one after the other and uh, it's called the vortex i've made a few versions of it but uh haven't had one yet that works without bugs so we're mm. trying very hard to get there um it'll get there yeah i mean and i mean yes and while i was sitting there i was just like oh i just want to have this panel on the vortex just i just yeah. want to give each person a chance to speak and then pass the mic and just let it keep going around you know it's it, i think it would also and you know it's not like people's fault that they talk so much people are so excited about what they want to say and they have so much they want to share it's hard to stop yourself you need it, it actually would liberate people if they knew okay you're just going to be cut off when you're done yeah. you're gonna your time's gonna end so Great you don't idea. have to feel bad you know it's several times that we had facilitators having to cut people off and it you could see how embarrassed and bad the person felt that they had to be cut off yeah and suddenly you feel like i went too long and now you feel like no one actually listened to you because everyone was getting you know it's such yeah. a bummer to feel like i just shared everything i have to say but now i feel like everyone was just annoyed with me while I was talking too long. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be solved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. And um, so let's see. Yeah. So there was that AI panel. Um, and then several experience, there was an experience, several experiencer panels. I mean, people that have been, had in incredibly crazy, interesting experiences with aliens, spirits. Um, there's a, uh, yeah, I mean, a guy that's, you know, had some near death experiences and severe brain injuries and been communicating with with spirits and, and can perceive, uh, you know, if uh, spirits or aliens have sort of taken over people. Um, he's kind of like a specialist in. Uh, he can detect that. Yeah, he literally he had several experiences where. Um, yeah, where people are basically possessed. And he says it, it can lead to, um, you know, people becoming addicts um, and things like that if they are um, possessed by, and, and, and his his view, he didn't really think of them as aliens. He saw them as, you know, people who died and their, um, and their spirit had a, and I mean, this sort of sounds kind of sci-fi to me that their spirit has a choice of going into the light, you know, and the light being sort of like a, uh, you know, uh, maybe like the next level of the simulation or something. But if they don't go into it because they're afraid or confused and they stay here, they sometimes go into another human and it can cause all sorts of problems for that human. <laughs> and uh, and so he helps people uh you know actually get these spirits out of them and he's because he can see them and communicate directly with them um and i really i believe this guy he was very um very interesting that's uh, fascinating yeah yeah i mean it's i mean that's why i went to this conference you know i i, I i've gone sort of oh his name was barry littleton yeah just a, he was born with past life memories began having paranormal experiences at a young age led him into a lifetime of research and exploration in the metaphysical and paranormal fields, including psychic abilities and mediumship. So I, I found him, he was a very interesting one. That reminds uh, me of Matias de Stefano. Have you heard of him? He's another, uh, he's another one that claims to have total recall of all of his past lives and memories. He's fascinating to listen to. So he has a, he has a show on, uh, Gaia called Initiation. And I just really went down that rabbit hole for a long time listening to him. Fascinating, really interesting. Yeah. Talks yeah. about all the different uh, races, the alien races. Well, not all of them. There's so many. But uh, he does talk about the, the alien uh, races and the planets and the systems. And um, yeah, anybody really interested in, in learning about one way to look at all of this 
through a storyline that he says is from his memories. Uh, I, I recommend that series. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And this event was sponsored by Gaia. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And the uh, Elizabeth April was there. I went to, she was actually the reason I went to the whole conference. Um, she is a very famous YouTube uh, uh, person who, uh, yeah, who, who says she, you know, she meditates and leads meditations and, and communicates again with the Galactic Federation. And she's written several books about all the things that she's learned. And, and I went to her thing and it was, uh, it was, it was kind of wild seeing her in person. I was hoping she would do a little bit more. She would do like a, you know, do something like those other guys did and directly communicate with aliens while we were there and let us ask questions, but she didn't, didn't do that. Mm. Um, but it's still interesting. Um, mm -hmm. and then there were, there were some, uh, like Randall Carlson was there. He's someone that's been on like ancient aliens and Nick Pope, uh, was there. It was funny. I saw there were these dances, um, this sort of, uh, after party each night and Daniel Sheehan and Nick Pope showed up to one of these dances <laughs> and it's just sort of like a club atmosphere. And <laughs> it, was, it was kind of, kind of funny. Yeah. Um, they seemed like a fish out of water there, but people were going up and taking selfies with them. Nick Pope is a famous uh, ufologist from former British uh, specialist. He ran the, the UAP program in Britain. That's great. Um, so Greer David, wasn't there, right? Stephen, no, 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 Stephen mm -hmm. Greer. David Childress, he's another sort of oh, yeah. famous ancient aliens guy. There was, I went to an ancient aliens panel there. Uh, they also had the guy that's the voice of ancient aliens, the one that says, you know, ancient alien theorists say yes um, right right the narrator the, yeah. yeah but I, the, the title of the ancient aliens panel was uh galactic history and i was like that's i love that i want to hear pe what people think the galactic history is but when i got to the panel they were just like telling their story of how they got involved with ancient aliens and the tv show and they were just sort of what's your favorite episode and yeah they didn't really so I just sort of skipped out of that one because I was like, okay, I want to hear what your theories are of galactic history. I want to, I love hearing people's theories of what aliens exist, what are their agendas, yeah. what are they doing, how, what are they, how, what have they been doing with humanity throughout history? Yeah, that's why I really loved the Matias de Stefano initiation series because it starts all the way back before Atlantis, you know, it's focused on the earth, obviously, earth uh, consciousness, evolution of aliens and all. And uh, it goes all the way back to the continent of Mu, um, which preceded Atlantis. And then he talks about the earth change. Oh, it's just fascinating stuff. So yeah, anybody who can give a, a story that sounds plausible, I'm listening to it. Yeah, it, sound, it could be true. Who knows? Yeah. Yes. And, um, oh, James Fox was there. He's a, a director and he is one of his biggest films on UFOs is called Moment of Contact. And there was a, a showing of it and I went to it and I highly recommend this. Um, oh, I'm going to write that down. It, it's a documentary about a, a UFO that um, landed in Brazil. And it, this thing, um, this thing, I believe the thing, the craft, I think was, uh, the craft was, I uh, think, grabbed by the government. There was military all over the place there, but an alien uh, got, was loose in this little town in Brazil. Oh. And three girls who were, I think they were around 12 or 13, they were playing and walking through this empty lot. And they saw this alien crouch down and scared and it looked at them. And it was like slimy and gray and black eye, I believe, or black or red eyes or something. And they screamed and ran and they ran home. And this, this movie is basically an interview. This was like, I think like 20 years ago. But the interview is recent. He went down there and just interviewed everyone that was still alive. And so uh, they ran home and they their mom comes out could feel before they even got there something was wrong and she came out and they told her what they had seen and they ended up being interviewed on the news and there's these old news videos of them terrified saying what they saw they they took them to the uh to the field um and showed them where it happened and now they're all grown up they're all like 
20, I don't know, 30 years old now. And so they had old interviews and new interviews. And, but back then there was also, um, bear, apparently the military found this alien and uh, one of the soldiers grabbed it and they wrestled it into a vehicle. But the soldier that grabbed it, uh, or maybe he was police, he developed a strange illness and he died as a result of something that like touching the slime on this alien. It, oh, it, wow. it, and they interviewed the doctors that uh, treated the guy and uh, who saw him. And then they were able to, James Fox was able to track down some of the other soldiers who actually helped transport the alien who had seen it. And one of them uh, who, who also knew the soldier that died, uh, he refused to be on camera, but um, I mean, he was refused to be seen fully on camera, but you heard his story. You heard the story from uh, a family also that was witnesses to some of this. And it was just, it was, I mean, so incredibly compelling. You believe all these people, this really, really, and it's, you know, it's, you can tell from the fear and the, the way they're speaking in the way, you know, the, it's it just like, it's, it's one of the most compelling, if you're, you know, if you doubt people's all these crazy alien abduction stories this is a absolutely one of the best things to watch to really just <laughs> help you understand to see these are real events something happened here listen to what they're describing they are, there's no motivation for them to lie you know they've been their lives have been changed and often messed up by having seen this because there's they have they, they tell you how the police and, and they have old, old news footage of the head of the local military, you know, and you can just tell by the way he's responding that he's so full of it. He's like Kirkpatrick. He's just lying and brushing them off. And, and, uh, oh, and the, the mother, this was the one, it just like hit me emotionally. The mother was saying that three men in black showed up at her house like a week after, um, I guess some ufologists went down to interview them right after this happened and then like 10 days after they left three men in black showed up and a man came into her house with a suitcase full of cash and he said we are going to make you very rich you just have to tell your girls that they never saw what they saw and you need to say they were lying and the mother was like no i am not taking your cash i'm not going to say my girls are lying they saw what they saw this is the truth and she told them to get out and i mean can you, I mean, these are poor people. They, she refused a suitcase full of cash. Probably very Christian. They weren't going to lie, right? So oh, it's just like, yeah. but it's so inspiring to, you know, have that level of integrity. And these, and there was another guy involved in the story also. He was like, he was like confronted by these three men in black at a gas station and told, never speak about this again. Is and this then, all in the movie moment? Yeah. What was it? Moment of contact. Moment of contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then James Fox, he takes his crew. They find another soldier who was directly involved with this, and they find his house. He's never been interviewed, and they and they he actually talks to them from a window, and he just tells them, "You need to get out of here, or I'm going to shoot you." He's just like, <laughs> and he basically he refuses to talk to them because they're scared. You know, there's it's clear the military. And, it, and and also it, the men in black, these were these were Americans. These are there was everyone is saying it was like U.S. officials of some sort immediately went down there and started to interfere with the truth of this story coming out. Um, so it's just like, I mean, it really reinforces the the narrative that there is some force deep in the U.S. government that has been part of of suppressing this truth. And that they are clearly willing to be jerks, to be threatening um, about it. And it's, it, it just, you know, it does, brings back the, that there's some sinister, sinister stuff yeah. behind this. You know, I don't know if how, how into my issue I want to go, but um, I was just listening to some videos this morning about uh, resonance and how different frequency resonances affect us. And this, this particular video was fascinating because if you look at each chakra in the body as a portal that's resonating at a certain you know, frequency, 
and the and depending on where we are putting our attention attention is so important where we're putting our attention now more than ever is drawing in these frequencies it's like taking a tuning fork say for a frequency of um you know five to eight hertz uh and you ring it anything in that room that is in the same frequency you know uh, vibrational potential is going to start resonating with it so if we are allowing our mind this is where meditation comes in if we are allowing our thoughts to go into frightening frequencies which are you know the 396 hertz root chakra and the 417 hertz sacral these are the survival fear uh paranoid um resonances and if we put our attention on those issues we will begin to bring everything to life that's in that frequency and so we i this is the way i'm approaching life right i want to maintain a frequency around the heart chakra which is you know and also there's very the the dna repair frequency is five to eight hertz anybody interested in so when you're meditating you can you can actually learn how to release these uh fear thoughts when you are in a stream of thinking tied to strong emotions having the ability to see it first of all and redirect it to a different frequency a higher frequency uh that's a superpower and people think well meditation is just you know to calm down and stop thinking about stuff but really it's an exercise of learning how to redirect your thoughts so we don't want to open those portals that are fearful and paranoid and because you're just going to start making that whole reality more solid so my uh my meditations are really centered around the heart around higher frequency that's the that's the real world i want to bring in and i think we have a lot of help right now on on the other side or whatever you want to call it from aliens there's a lot of help coming through for anybody willing to open those portals that that we will be guided and the, the whole goal as i said before is to kind of build this uh heaven on earth to hybridize our consciousness so that we can experience heaven in this three-dimensional plane and that's that's the goal i think and that that i resonate with so um well, excellent well with that shall we transition to our closing meditation that'd be great that'd be All great right. and uh how long do you want to uh let's let's go with 10 minutes i know uh to really get the benefit of meditation i in my, in my experience and i've been doing it for decades and decades 20 minutes is the minimum to really start to get the uh benefit of it but let me just you know do a 10 minute here and well, that's just an introduction and your listeners can continue afterwards if they want to great All right. okay so should we start yeah ready i'll invite everybody to find a comfortable position and recognizing that there's a lot of energy right now and uh, everybody's kind of buzzing so let's I'm going to ring the bell and we'll start by just getting grounded listening to the bell from the beginning to the end. Now let's begin to take a very conscious deep breath. Just put our, put our attention on our breath, wherever we feel it most clearly. And just begin to take a nice deep breath in. You'll feel it a little cooler at the nostrils and a little warmer coming out. So we're just paying attention to the body right here, right now, in the way it's breathing. When you hear sounds, you just notice them and come back to the breath.
It's inevitable that the mind will wander, and the practice of meditation is to see it, to recognize I have wandered away again on my train of thoughts. Recognize it, see it for what it is, and then it choose to come back to the breath. This is your anchor. Exercising this ability of releasing. First notice and then release is a superpower. We get so drawn into trains of thought without any control. So just seeing it and releasing it takes practice. Meditation is for the mind. What exercise is for the body? Returning to our breath. It could be another sensation such as a clock ticking. The intention is to just return to this moment and then this moment and then this moment. Breathing in, breathing out. So what I like to do with my energy is to set the intention of lifting my energy into feelings of gratitude, connection, even adventure, curiosity, So we want to raise our frequency to a place that feels inviting, comfortable, fun. Fun is a great one. Just that sense of joy, the joie de vivre. Breathing in, breathing out. We're all in this together.
Let's open that portal of love in the heart and make that connection. And from this portal, we can invite whatever wisdom we need in order to complete this project of bringing heaven to earth. If we can keep this portal of love open, then we can be sure that every step we take and every word we say is coming from the right place, moving us in the right direction. Kindness and honesty. Those are the tools. We are being guided. All we have to do is listen with loving awareness. Right here, right now. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Until next time. Bye-bye.